Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host and the founder of Prep Athletics, Corey Heights. And today we have a special guest in Brady Bergeson. Brady is the head men's basketball coach at Regis University and was hired back in 2015. Uh, he played and graduated from Chapman University before becoming an assistant at Sacramento State. And from there, he became the head coach of Western Oregon University. Uh, we're excited to have Brady on today to talk about his background, Regis University, and give us a nice tutorial on all things D2. Brady, welcome to the show. Thank you, Corey. It's an honor to be here with you. You are the closest uh, podcaster I've had. We're probably 15 miles away right now. We probably should have done this in person, but uh, I don't even know how to hook that up. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we're still coming out of the COVID dark ages and we're used to just doing everything on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, we both look better in Technicolor right now anyway. So, um, so hey, tell me, uh, getting started out, where did you grow up and why did you pick basketball as your sport? Yeah, I grew up in Longy, Washington. I'm a West Coast guy originally. Uh, I, um, I was a baseball and basketball guy growing up. Baseball was always the first love. Uh, that kind of flipped when I hit high school. I played for a legendary coach named Bill Backamus at Mark Morris High School. Uh, and I think that probably had some impact on just my passion. I began falling more and more in love with the game of basketball. I kind of realized... I was about uh, 16 years old, and it just sort of dawned on me that I was going to be a coach. I knew what I wanted to do. I kind of knew it was my calling at that point. And sort of from that point on, I knew basketball was my route. I just fell deeper and deeper in love with the game and um, kind of set my sights on that and tried to just follow that path forward. And it's uh, it's worked pretty well, and uh, I certainly have, am more in love with the game than I ever have been and continue to fall in love with it all the time. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I'm a West coast guy at Washington to uh, Southern California for, for college. And, um, you know, eventually went out to Sacramento state and, uh, then up to Western Oregon before coming here to Regis. Perfect. Now, did you go straight to Sacramento state right from graduating from Chapman? No, I, uh, I actually, I knew I wanted to coach, I coached two years of high school basketball at Tustin High School right out of college. Mm -hmm. As soon as I graduated, I started helping the summer league. Uh, my mentor and one of my best friends in the world is Rich Bossmeyer, the head coach of Tustin High School. He's been there, still there, 20 years. And it was his, he, he had just taken that job, so he was just kind of getting it up on its feet. I came in to help, and he, he said, hey, listen, I know you want to get to the college game. Come help me for two years. Help me get this thing up and going, and I'll help you find a spot. And he did um, two years with with coach and he helped me get a foot in the door uh, with Mike Dunlap at Metro State. Mike Dunlap is, uh, you know, as we talk here in mid-July, is the one of the assistant coaches of the Milwaukee Bucks now in the NBA finals. And um, I worked for him for four years. I was at Metro for for six total, which uh, really was instrumental in my development as a coach my understanding of the game and and just opened my world up completely and um so that was my there were two stops before sacramento state i went from metro to sacramento state where uh, brian katz hired me at sacramento state when he took over the program to rebuild and what was one of the worst division one programs at the time um and uh you know he needed a lot of heavy lifting and work to get that culture change and the the program on its feet um but uh, that was that was the path, and um, we it's been uh, it's been a, a beautiful one. It's been difficult, crawled at times along it, but um, got a lot of great experience now. And you know, Western Oregon's a Division II program that we it was my first head coaching job, uh, and then uh, saw a great opportunity here at Regis um, to come in and and uh, try to make a difference here as well. And so I think we're on the right track. So you, what division was Chapman when you played out there? Is that D2? Three, Division Three. Division Three. So you've been at Division Three school. You played. You've coached at Division Two level. You've coached at D1 level. Um, can you give 
everybody kind of your perception on what the difference is uh, between those levels. Yeah, so th this is a common educational uh, sort of spiel that I'll give to parents who are sort of navigating this for the first time, which is common. Um, the main difference to me, division one, two, and three, um, obviously there is the talent ability level and uh, the lines get blurred in between the, the divisions. So meaning uh, division one, we generally associate with the big time programs that we see, the power fives that we see, um, at, you know, on TV all the time and going to the final four all the time. And then we sort of see some of the smaller schools in the tournament, you know, that maybe we've never heard of or seldom heard of. Um, there are 300 and I don't know, 40 or 50 division one schools. Um, division two, uh, roughly the same number of schools. Uh, now the lines get blurred from talent, you know, from division to division, meaning for instance, I'm at Sacramento state as an assistant coach. And I go from there to Western Oregon university and Western Oregon was a, when I took it over, it was about a 500 program, just, just under 500 kind of flopping around mediocre and to, to poor. And, you know, we came in there and they actually had a pretty good core of guards and we, you know, uh, replaced some, you know, frontline guys and we had a good year, you know, we were, you know, borderline, you know, we were one game short of the tournament and we were in a really competitive league. That Western Oregon team was hands down better than the Sacramento state team. I had just left. And would it have been a battle between the two? It had been, you know, close. We were better. We were at better players. It was just a better team. And so that's not necessarily, you can't say that for all, um, programs, but a good division two team, a team that is knocking on the door in the top 25 in the country, they're going to be in the top half of any sort of low to mid major conference. In my opinion, you know, um, Sacramento state's in the big sky. I've had a couple of teams that would have been in the top half of the big sky, you know, in my years as a head coach at the division two level division three is the same way. There's going to be fewer of them, but a, a national contending division three team is, is a, Division one team masquerading as a division three team. And there are subtle differences, you know, the division one, usually the front lines are bigger. Um, you know, you might be given up an inch or two uh, at any given position, but skill sets, ability to shoot, IQ, toughness, things like that that go into winning um, that are instrumental in winning. You're not going to notice any differences. You're going to notice differences between really well-run programs and not so well-run programs. That's what you'll realize there. And really the big difference is, is in the bodies and, you know, the level of athleticism. Now it's a whole nother level when you go up to the power five and those guys have the pick of the litter. Um, that's, that's a, you know, they've got bodies that you just can't sometimes, um, you know, contend with or, or very seldom can, but, um, when you start getting into sort of the middle of the lower end of the pack, those lines get blurred to me, the biggest, so back to the educational piece for parents and kids that are maybe navigating, um, the levels from a scholarship standpoint, division one programs all have 13 full scholarships. They can't split them up. They have to give 13, um, and 13 fulls and that's it. Division two is kind of the great uh haves versus the have nots this is where you're going to get you know 350 schools 350 different ways of uh you know organizing their scholarships and we get a maximum of 10 equivalencies meaning 10 full ride equivalencies at division two you can't give more than 10 equivalencies many schools are well below that so you might have a school in your league i might have a school in my league that gives five and a quarter. That's how much scholarship dollars they have for their school. That's determined by the school then not. So the NCAA right. allows up to 10, but each school has to figure out budget wise. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And that differs greatly. Like I'm at Regis university, it's a private school. You know, the, the full sticker price here is about $52,000. You know, you get academic aid and things like that. So a full ride here is over $50,000. 
uh, a full ride at said, you know, state school X might be $8,000 for in-state tuition or $12,000 or 15 for out-of-state tuition or whatever the case is. So the dollar amounts can vary greatly as can the packages that the schools will give you. So division two schools can, if they want, uh, give partial scholarships rather than full. Division one can't do partial scholarships. So, you know, we can package together, say, um, you know, $10,000 of academic money with $10,000 of athletic money. And now we got you $20,000 total. Maybe you have a Pell Grant that you can use uh, to give you another $5,000 or whatever it is. Um, those are things that are commonplace in division two. Uh, now division three, it's, you can just think of it all as essentially preferred walk-ons. Nobody gets any athletic money that you're not allowed to give athletic scholarships at division three. Those are generally, you know, the division three model is supposed to be the, um, academics first, you know, they're ac more academic schools, generally speaking, and, uh, they don't want to do the athletic scholarship thing at the division three level. There's some rule differences as well, but um, as kids and parents navigate, I think those are the sort of the basics of kind of figuring out what's what. Um, I would say this, Corey, also, if, you know, if any of the listeners are trying to figure out, you know, what does a scholarship mean? What does that come from? I think parents and kids need to ask questions, uh, particularly the Division II schools, if they are involved in the recruiting about, okay, how much money is this? Where is it coming from? You know, if, if a school, for instance, says, hey, we're going to give you a full, well, okay, tell me exactly what that full is. You know, oftentimes uh, schools will, for instance, use your Pell Grant and, you, you know, they're going to assume you have a Pell Grant and they're going to assume that you're going to use that as a part of your scholarship and they'll assume that that's a full you may be thinking, well, you're going to give me a full and I'm going to get a Pell Grant on top of it. Some schools might do that. And that can be a five, $6,000 difference every year. Um, so you need to know what you're getting into, um, you know, and you need to ask a lot of questions about the scholarship, uh, what it includes, what it doesn't include, uh, those sorts of things. Gotcha. It's complex at the D2 level, it sounds like, because you probably, if you like a kid, you got to figure out how much money you're going to allot to him. You're going to figure out how much financial aid he can get from uh from his family situation, plus academic, plus Pell. So you are probably constantly uh, having to get creative with this, I'm assuming. Creative is the word. Yes. Yep. That is exactly right. It's, it's a, and when you're, when you're planning your team over the course of not just one year, but two, three, four years out, and you're trying to, for instance, maybe you're trying to balance your classes a certain way. So you don't have, you know, 15 juniors and seniors, and then you got to turn the entire, you got to plan that out and you got to figure out uh, also how much money it's going to take, for instance, to get the player said player that you really need to fit that roster spot. Um, and it is complex because sometimes we really want a guy and we don't have enough money to offer him. Sometimes, you know, we get uh, a guy that we can, who's really good. And, you know, for whatever reason, um, we can get him a lot of academic aid or whatever case he doesn't need a lot of scholarship money. So we generally at our place deal in fulls, but we have some partials. We have obviously preferred walk-ons as well. Uh, we recruit everybody that we get. Um, but it is absolutely some creativity. The other part is that, you know, for us and for many division two schools, the dollar amount can shift and change year to year. So while you're trying to plan these things, you may not have what you had last year, or maybe your fundraising went beautifully and you have some extras at the end, but you hadn't been planning on it. Um, so, you know, those things are moving targets as well. Uh, we do have to get creative and spend a lot of time sort of uh, working through spreadsheets and whiteboards, trying to figure out how to patch it together the right way. Yeah, wow. How many scholarships does Regis give out full? Uh, we're right now, we're at about seven and a half, um, equivalencies and, um, you know, there's differences and, you know, we got a couple of three kids, for instance, right now on that are in grad school. Um, and those kids are a little bit less expensive. Grad school tuition is a little less so we can, you know, that, that saved us a little bit here. Um, 
So right now we're at about seven and a half, you know, equivalencies. Um, and again, some of these kids are, some of our kids are on, you know, partial, maybe it's tuition only. Um, some are on full and it, you know, it just depends, you know, other, other schools have, you know, things like housing waivers and we don't have housing waivers. You know, this just comes to, you know, full dollar amount for us. Some, some programs have some, you know, meal vouchers and things that they can do like that, that are different. Some schools, state schools have, uh, for instance, in the West, there's what's called the WUI program, Western University Exchange, where uh, when I was at Western Oregon, for instance, we could have um, anybody within the, whatever it was, 12 uh, Western states, if they came from those states, it would be tuition and a half rather than full out of state cost, which was significantly more. Um, so there's, there's a lot of little tricky elements when you get into the division two. And that's why I encourage parents and kids to ask a lot of questions about it to try to get a full well-rounded idea of it. Um, here's another one, Corey, that no one thinks of health insurance. Mm. So, uh, Regis, as I am told, is the only school in our conference who provides secondary health insurance for our athletes. Um, all of our athletes have to have their own health insurance. It's, you can't participate until you get a proof of health insurance. And the international kids have to buy their health insurance coming in because they're international kids. Well, most division two schools, as I'm told, don't provide any health insurance. So if you get injured while playing, 100% of that would fall on those kids' families' health insurance plans. And at Regis, we have a secondary health insurance. So you're not going to come out of pocket anything if you get hurt while practicing or playing. Uh, you know, that's, you're not going to, the deductible, whatever might be over the top of your insurance, Regis covers. And that's not actually a, a, a normal necessarily a normal thing and those are things that you'd never think of mm -hmm. right as you're navigating through the landscape here yeah no that is interesting yeah some and yeah that's that yeah that's interesting on that and that's something you never i've never even heard of so it's, it's right. going to be a part of your pitch what what's a benefit you could tell a kid of maybe playing d2 versus d3 versus d1 like what why go d2 just stereotypically yeah well I think there's a couple of reasons, you know, first of all, for us specifically, we're always looking for that. And I think most division two schools would be this way. Obviously there's certain things that we feel like are a good fit, and not a good fit for us specifically the way we run our program. Um, but kids who we find and do pretty well with kids who are really on sort of that division one bubble there, we think they're division one players but commonly they are missing one part of their game. They're two inches too short. They're half a step slow. They have the whole package, but they don't shoot it real well, whatever the case is. And with those kids, why you would play division two basketball is that we have a team full of those guys. And as we develop over the course of a year, two years, three years, into your career, all of a sudden those skills that you were lacking, you've become a little better athlete. You've, you know, you've grown an inch, you've become stronger, more efficient. Uh, you can shoot the ball a little bit now. Uh, whatever that thing was that kept you out of maybe high school from being that division one player um, you've got now. And, and you, part of development is playing. Mm -hmm. So those kids, Sometimes they do, you know, somebody takes them in, you know, May or June or July and they get, you know, they're the 12th or 13th guy on that roster. And, you know, we'll division ones have the luxury of taking a flyer on a kid. Well, you know, the, the June signees from this year or next year's transfer portal kids typically. And uh, so what's missing is the commitment level and it, combined with some playing time. And that's, you can't, develop without getting a kid some playing time uh, we can run through all the drills and workouts and we are you know we take a lot of pride in our ability to help kids develop and get better that's what our program is built around but 
part of that equation is the skill building and then the application into, you know, the time under fire where you're actually in a game and we're depending on you to come through and apply those skills uh, to the game scenario. And if you were recruited as a 12th or 13th guy, yeah, you might squeeze through that tight spot in division one school and come out the other end. But while you're getting the skill building stuff, you're not playing, you know, you you stand a better chance at getting the playing time here combined with the, the skill building and the development piece. Um, the other thing is that, you know, typically there's a big difference between a bad program that loses even if the coaching staff's really good and, you know, they have good players, but it's, but, but they lose and they're at the division one level. There's a big difference between playing and being living in a losing locker room and being on a losing team and being on a winning team, regardless of level. And there's a difference in terms of the happiness, the fulfillment that you're getting, the quality of your experience, which when kids leave and they look back, uh, they look at a few different things that actually kind of hold water. And to me, one is how is your relationship with your teammates and your coaching staff? Um, two is, did the coaching staff have a plan for you? Or did they just take you because they're a flyer and you were six, nine, and we needed a guy, you know, in late May. And so we just grabbed you off the shelf. Or did they actually have a plan for you? And, you know, these are things that are, are you being used uh, with to your abilities, meaning the coaching staff had a plan for you. They're developing you towards that plan. How's your relationship with the players? That's going to revolve around how healthy is the locker room? Is it a winning culture? Is it a losing, losing culture? And there's a difference. And do you have a relationship with the, with the head coach and the assistants? How's your relationship? And those things kids take away. They don't take away, uh, you know, the gear, the size of the arena, the fact that it's division one, the fact that it's division two, they don't care after about a few months in that program, if they're shooting in some giant arena on a gun, or if they're shooting in the Regis field house on a gun, they don't care about that anymore. What they care about is their relationships and the experience they're having, how they're being used in their role. And so those are reasons I'm not saying division two is the answer for everybody and everybody should want to go division two, but if you really are after, if your dream is to have a great college basketball experience, play in a winning program, which might mean that you're playing even at the national level, you know, you're actually targeting a national championship rather than just a, you know, a low major league championship as your, as your North star. Um, that's a difference. And it's a difference in the experience that you're going to have that you're going to take away for the rest of your life. So I think oftentimes kids get, enamored with just it's just d1 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 as we know that's the the d1 dream is real um and sometimes that's the exact right move for those kids and they should exactly what they should do but if their value system um is a little bit deeper than that then they may see more value in a program for instance like ours and many others division two programs that are um kind of built on relationships we're winning cultures it's a winning it's a championship level organization and on the right year, we're going to play at the national level and be, you know, potentially nationally ranked and in the national tournament. And that's fun. You know, that's experience you never forget. Um, Division three, I was frustrated with as a player, Corey. Uh, it's it's a it's also really good basketball. My frustration with Division three basketball is that they can't spend any time with you in the off season. Mm -hmm. So your development is essentially purely on your own. And, you know, I think that detracts from the experience for the player uh, because you don't have that part of the relationship with your coaching staff. You don't have the, the investment in you and your development and you just don't get as good as quick when you're just trying to work on your own skills by yourself or trying to go find a, an outside trainer or whatever the case is. Um, and so for me personally, as, a, as an athlete, that was my frustration with division three. Um, and that's again, you know, back to the question, why division two, I think that's a big reason why, you know, it's an advantage that we have. Absolutely. Now tell me about the recruiting timeline. Like you probably deal with a lot of kids locally 
and through your connections that are just sitting around waiting for D1 offers. And you know that they're the type of kid that probably, just like you just mentioned, would, would thrive more to D2 program. So how do you time your recruiting with kids? And do you have to wait longer to get them? Good question. We generally do, yeah. Our, our, our timeline is generally a little later than the Division ones, And oftentimes, really, Division threes. I think Division threes are so academic that many of the not all, but many programs have application deadlines at the division three level that are really early. And so those coaches are working real hard in the summers to, you know, get those upcoming seniors that they target as division three guys. Um, for us, again, we're usually battling with division one schools for our kids because that's kind of that, that thin slice of the population that we're really after. And very few kids are interested in, you know, signing early division two when they think they're a division one player. And that's really the, the kid that we're generally looking at. Um, so we, we signed very few kids early. We actually signed our first one early this last November. It was a local kid um, who was really good. And, and, you know, he's exactly right there on that sort of division one bubble. Uh, we're excited to have him, but most of the vast majority of what we're doing is after the season into April and May, that's really when, um, you know, the, the reality sets in where these division ones that were flirting with me, I still haven't gotten an offer. I still haven't gotten an offer. Um, I need to look at some other things you know, I need to look at these division twos. So what we'll do, Corey is, you know, we go out in the summer, like anybody in spring, the summer, and we target guys. Uh, we work our network year round, 12 months a year on trying to target the right guys that, might just barely slip through the cracks and um, we start to slowly build relationships with them for us it's a slow burn you know we know we're probably not going to bring a kid out in a fall visit because he's not gonna be ready to sign yet and so we just kind of hang around get to know him you know maybe go see him during the season those sorts of things and then we'll slowly pick up steam depending on which way the road turns with that kid um, and where the relationship goes you know if uh if he doesn't end up getting that division one offer that he's kind of holding out for, then oftentimes we're in great position to um, come in and, and get that kid. And, and um, he'll listen a lot more in the springtime. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, you, your focus is it high school kids, junior college kids, D one transfers. What is it? We, we do a little of all of it. Um, our focus is high school kids. We're very much a development program. I love having kids here for four or five years. Um, I, I enjoy the relationship part of it. I enjoy watching the the young adolescent boy walk through the door, and then you know the twenty two year old, you know bearded college kid walk out of the door four years later. I enjoy that the timeline of the development, and I think that's where we do our best work. So our our core is really built around high school kids, but. With that said, year to year, you know, you have certain needs um, and sometimes you need a guy that's a little bit older, maybe a little bit more mature, been through it a little bit. Um, so, yep, like like most schools, we will be recruiting the, the transfers, both junior college and four year transfers as well. Uh, just really depends year to year on our needs. OK, um, is there anything we did not touch on that you think people need to know about the D2 level, Brady? Um, we hit recruiting, we hit timeline, we hit scholarships, we hit the level of play. I think really you gave a great overview that people, um, maybe wouldn't have known about before. I hope so. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I just think, you know, in terms of finding a little bit of, um, I guess balance, you know, the, the, the old division two motto is life in the balance. And I guess it can be a little corny, but, you know, some things to consider the higher you go, the more corporate it becomes, meaning division one basketball is much more of a, what I consider a corporate world. Um, it's more transactional. The, you know, when you look at John Calipari and, you know, those, the, all the guys, at that level they i just look at them they're incredible coaches and they're good people 
um, they're, they're CEOs of major corporations. And so they're, you know, consider their employees um, are very much corporate employees. And it's a very much of a generally cultural, culturally, it's a corporate sort of feel. Um, I, I, again, there's exceptions to everything, Corey, but uh, you know, when you go to the division one route, that's much more going to be a part of your experience. And, um, the division two is going to be, there's always a business aspect of it, especially when there's scholarship dollars and money involved, but, um, you know, that sort of thing is, is far less apparent and it's much more, and, and certainly Regis at, at Regis, we operate much more like a mom and pop shop. To me, that means we're very relationship based. We're grounded, you know, we're, um, we're here to spend time with our kids and develop them as people. And that doesn't mean the division one coaches don't because they do and the good ones do. Um, but, you know, we don't have the overwhelming pressures that those guys have to deal with um, that can sometimes force your hand to maybe treat people in more of a transactional manner. Um, so I think it allows us to have uh, more clarity of mind when we're forming and building our relationships with our kids. Um, I think it gives us more uh, freedom to be ourselves a little bit and not to have to just chop a kid because, you know, X, Y, or Z happened and it's a transactional situation and it's the way it goes. So um, I think there, you know, at the same time, we do have scholarship money to offer. At the same time, we are a development program. We have lots of time to spend with our kids, developing them off in the off season. And, and we develop plans for our guys um, you know, we, we do all of those same things that you can do, uh, at the higher levels and with potentially, instead of being one of 13, perhaps you're one of eight, nine, 10, 11, something like that with, um, with maybe a little bit more potential for a serious role or a higher level of, um, uh, you know, the role or expectation of what you can do um, as a ball player. Uh, so I think uh, I think we covered everything I can think of, Corey. I just kind of wanted to squeeze that in there if I could. That's uh, at a 30,000 foot view. That's sort of how I see it. Perfect. Now, give me your elevator pitch for Regis. Like, why should a player come to Regis both academically, academically, and, and additionally, culturally? Well, the, the basketball piece we talked about, I, I don't have a whole lot else to offer there. I think we're built around the right things. We're a winning organization. We're a championship organization. Um, the academic piece is actually a big reason why I came to Regis is I was so attracted to the school itself. We're in Denver, Colorado. It's gorgeous. One of the great cities of the country, as you know, you live here. Um, and uh, I think that we have a lot to offer that way. We're a Jesuit university. So um, we had, which, so we're the same family as the Marquettes and the Creightons and the Gonzagas of the world. Um, the Jesuits do education right. It's a liberal arts education. It's really high level. They're very hands-on with the instructors. You have relationships with your instructors, the smaller class sizes. They take the academic piece very seriously in a good way. And so it's a high level uh, of education and experience, academic experience. Um, Corey, the things that we look for other, outside of talent, you know, for us would be, you know, we aggressively seek out kids that come from winning programs. I think that's important. I think recruiting programs as much as players is important. Um, number two, I want those kids to have a history of having good relationships with their coaches. Most kids do, most basketball players do, but there's the players that, you know, the famous line is, well, I didn't see eye to eye with my coach. How many times have you heard that one? Oh, I didn't see eye to eye. Well, that, you know what? If you don't see eye to eye with your other coach, there's a good chance you're not gonna see eye to eye with me either. And I know that it's more nuanced and complex than that in, in many situations, but, 
One of the questions I ask coach when I'm recruiting his kid, usually it's one of my very first questions. And I learned this from my mentor, Brian Katz at Sacramento state. And it's true as gold. Do you like the kid? Do you like the kid? And immediately I know the answer when you answer, because you're going to either jump through the phone and go, I love this kid. He's great. Here's why blah, blah, blah. you're going to, you can talk all day about him. Or you're going to say, yeah, you know, I, I do. I really like him. Uh, he, you know, and then you can hear it. The answer mm -hmm. was no, the answer was no. And so when coaches don't value that relationship with the kid or the kid, you know, is a coach hater who, you know, well, yeah, he was okay. But you know what, our, our program is built around relationships. And, and if, if you can't have good relationships with your coaches in the past, you probably, I don't know why I'd be any different. So we look for that. Um, and then we try to just, you know, we listen for and look for signs of, of guys that are, that value, um, brotherhood on a team. A lot of our guys that we end up getting voluntarily just start talking about how important it is that their high school team, or their prep school team or their junior college team or whatever, either had or didn't have that special camaraderie in the locker room with their guys. And they are seeking that. That's something that they want. And they voluntarily say it without us asking that specific question. And again, those are things that we really value as important to our culture and our program. And so we listen for that and look for that as well. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that about Regis. Uh, to me, I think it's a great option because I know with a lot of the prep school kids I work with, um, there are a lot of D2 players in New England. And there's a lot of D2 schools up there recruiting them. And maybe kids want to get out of New England and, you know, see a different part of the country. And to me, obviously, I moved to Denver because uh, it's one of my favorite places in the world a couple of years ago. And I think a lot of kids would be very open to play at the high level in the RMAC, which is your league, get the Regis education, play on a top 25 team and just have a different, um, you know, uh, location than just maybe the Northeast. Right. So I think that's a positive thing for you. And I've been really, you know, I try to stay neutral on things, but I do try to share the Regis name with uh, as many kids. I think it could play at your level as possible because I think it's a nice option that they might not see on a day to day basis if they're based on the East Coast. Absolutely. I, I, I agree entirely with you. And thanks to you, we've been more and more involved in some of the prep school recruiting out that way. Um, and really, we're, we're very much coast to coast. We find that, you know, the quality of life in Denver, I mean, there's a reason why Denver is one of the fastest growing cities in the country. There's, and kids come here at, from Los Angeles or the East Coast or the Midwest. Um, and oftentimes they just stay. They, they, you know, they never intended to when they came, but boy, it's, it's really good out here. And uh, we've got a lot going for us in this state and in this city. Um, so again, I mean, that's one of the big selling points for me in this job and our vision for this program and how we could imagine it being sort of a built to last sort of organization. Uh, and part of that was the location. You just can't beat it. Uh, the quality of education is hard to beat, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Brady, we're going to do a fun segment now called famous alumni from your school. And we normally do this with prep schools, but we can do it with, with colleges as well. And um, I'm going to name these names off here. And you tell me if you can tell me uh, what their significance is as alum of Regis. Okay. okay. So the first one, kind of his name gives it away, but uh, Richard Cabela. Richard Cabela, the name does give it away, uh, especially if you're an outdoorsman, like there are so many of out this way. Um, I, I, is he the uh, director, founder, CEO of Cabela's? He created Cabela's. Yes, he is the founder of Cabela's. You get your one for one right now. Okay. Yes, founder of Cabela's. Those of you who don't know or live in the Midwest, Cabela's is like your bass uh, outdoor world. It's just, it's it's giant for outdoor hunting and uh, camping equipment. Next up, Arnie Herber. Arnie Herber. <laughs> I do not know, Corey. <laughs> Arnie Herber played football at Regis and he is now in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He must have done some great stuff in the NFL, but he is in Canton, Ohio now at the Hall of Fame. So, hey, you did some tremendous research because I don't even know the last year that Regis had a football team. I have, there's an old picture on the athletics wall of these guys, you know, it must've been from the twenties or thirties. 
playing football. So I'm going to guess that might've been the last time uh, that we had him. He must've been on that team. Yeah. That's, I got a, some good research. Yeah. I got a crack research team. It's called Wikipedia. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. John Farley. John Farley is the late, great Chris Farley's brother. You got it. He is an actor. I looked him up. Didn't recognize anything he's been in. Oh, I mean, he's been in some stuff, but he's, he must've been a, a background player, but yes, Chris Farley's brother went here. And finally, the most famous culturally uh, Regis alum is Bill Murray. And this guy, uh, rumor has it, he still makes unannounced appearances uh, on and around campus. I think he likes to once in a while drop in on the Rocky Top Tavern across the street, make his way over to campus and pop in on some people and uh, make some jokes. There's some good stories uh, from the old uh alumni you know in the in the the seventies and so forth about Bill Murray and the thing the shenanigans he was up to on campus as a student you can probably imagine. But uh yeah he is definitely the most famous one. Okay. Well that was this uh week's episode of fun famous alumni from the school uh we were discussing today. So thank you for guessing you were uh you were three for four. So Arnie Arnie Herbert tripped you up. So you'll never forget that again, I bet Brady. I will not, Arnie Herbert. Hey, what are your thoughts and how has it affected you, the NCAA transfer rule where kids don't have to sit out? Yeah, I think for all Division II, this has become a pretty concerning uh, for coaches. And I'm on a committee that's a uh, national committee that's talked a lot about it. We can't control it. Um, the rule that you're referring to is that kids can transfer one time uh, essentially to uh, a division one school from any school without having to sit previously if you transferred from a division one to a division one or a division two to a division one or division three to a division one you had to sit a year essentially red shirt uh, before becoming eligible that's no longer the case i think the ncaa succumbed to a lot of um, groundswell pressure the kids kind of just want to be free agents. I think there's a, what I would call a free agent culture in basketball right now where everybody wants to be like LeBron and KD and just go where they want when they want. I think there's less of a commitment to, um, you know, to finding a place that they will be happy based on um, some of the things that we talked about before that, that really are, you know, um, substantial when it comes to actual happiness of your experience. And I think it's unfortunate. I don't like where it's gone. I don't like that the NCAA, um, I think succumbed to that pressure. Um, I don't think it's good for the game. I do think it's a double-edged sword, Corey. I think there's, you know, I don't think the players were the only ones that created the culture of transfer, uh, you know, with the pressure that coaches are under is one of the most volatile professions in the country um coaches are much more likely again to speak to sort of the cutthroat corporate corporate environment that many of them have to operate in at the division one level you know they just discard kids um without a thought you know oh you found a better kid let's sign them let's over sign and then we'll figure out who to get rid of later that's so commonplace at the division one level and i think you know, so to some degree, maybe the, the culture has grown from that as well. I don't think coaches are immune to some of these problems that we've created, but I think it's double-edged sword. Um, I, I don't like where it's gone for the game. Um, I'm old school that way. You know, we will recruit transfers, but, um, you know, we really want to try and find kids that value loyalty um, and that see the value in what we have here and aren't using, you know, this even in the back of their mind as sort of a stepping stone in their own mind. And I think that's the wrong approach when you're choosing a school and a program altogether. So if we sniff that out, we, we try to stay away from that if we can. Um, but back to the rule itself, I think the rule is just to, you know, it's a response to the culture that is there. Um, I think division two is a little behind the scenes, although we can still block kids from transferring division two to division two and those sorts of things where you might still have to sit out a year. 
So we need to get our legislation caught up to speed with the division one. Um, but it's unfortunate, but it is it's the reality of where we're living and we've all got to kind of live by the, the rules and navigate through it the best we can. But in theory, since there's been less spots available at the D1 world this year, right? Because yeah. of all the transfers, should that in theory make D2 better? Because D2 is getting more players that are normally playing at the D1 level. And then same, same is true for D3. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we're I, I, I think we're seeing that right now with the number of kids. I think there's sort of a general talent ability threshold that uh kids that would normally have had opportunities at a division two school, for instance, are not finding any out there right now. Um, and likewise, division one, division three, mm -hmm. you know, and so I, you know, there's a bottleneck with the extra year of, of eligibility that all the kids got from COVID. Um, and there's a bottleneck of talent. I think that certainly some of that has trickled down to division two. I think the talent level probably over the next two, three years will be really good um, uh, at all levels, but division two for sure. Um, so I think there's, it'll be really interesting. And I don't think this bottleneck problem is gonna end in one year either, Corey. I think there'll probably mm -hmm. be some sort of slow burn off over the course of two or three years before we start to feel like maybe it's back to kind of what it used to be as my guess. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's not uncommon saying that. Um, yeah, it's going to take some time. So what I tell kids, it's not popular, but you've had 18 years to get good. Now it's judgment day and you're either good enough to play at the level you want to, or you got to get more realistic with the current terms. So right. what are you going to do? Hey, we're going to do our lightning round now, Brady, and okay. finish up here with some fun, quick questions. What's the biggest win of your career as a coach? Oh, um, well, I probably, level. yeah. Um, good question. So I would probably go with, um, our, our Mac championship game, uh, 2018, we won at Regis, we won our first, um, our Mac tournament championship, um, putting us in as a three seed into the NCAA tournament that year, we had a really nice run. Um, and it was on the road at Fort Lewis, which at the time had won something like 66 home games in a row or something like that. They were the one seed. They hosted the tournament. Uh, we were on their home floor um, and we beat them out there in uh, just a really memorable game. It was great, uh, great environment, hostile. And obviously we enjoyed the heck out of the outcome. Nice. How about the best player you've ever uh, coached against? That one's easy, actually. I have a lot of good players, but I was an assistant uh, at Sacramento State, and Weber State was my scout, and the great Damian Lillard was there, and so I was tasked with trying to figure out how to slow that guy down. Uh, it didn't happen very much. Uh, Damian Lillard was unbelievable from the time he set foot there, and um, uh, he was impossible to game plan against. Um, and he is currently my favorite player in the NBA, incidentally, not just because I got to coach against him and watch how great he was in person, but um, I just think he stands for all the right things. Mm -hmm. I just love the way that guy carries himself. How about best player you ever played against personally? Jason Terry, state tournament, Seattle, Washington. He played, he was a year behind me at Franklin High School. I had to guard him. Uh, and he was unbelievable. It just the ease at which the game came to that kid uh, was unreal. And it didn't surprise me at all that he had a, whatever, he had a 20 year career or something in the NBA. Yeah. What about your uh, hobbies that you take part in when you're not coaching? You know, Corey, I'm, my life's pretty simple. I, I'm here and I coach and then I go home and I've got a beautiful family and wife. Uh, and I spend time with my kids. I got, um, nine six and two year olds at home and so those guys dominate my time and my energy uh when i'm not here so we're doing family things uh whatever that might be and that's essentially where my hobbies have gone um outside of coaching which i wouldn't have it any other way you know i really only want to be really good at two things in my life anymore and one of them's uh being a, a leader of this organization and the other one is is my family and I, I gotta make sure I do both is to the top of my ability. So um playing with those kids is my hobby. 
That's perfect. And last but not least, what's your favorite movie of all time? Ooh, good one. Um, I'm going to go with Goodwill Hunting. How about them apples? How about them apples? Yeah. It's a classic. <laughs> it's a good one. Well, that's great. Well, Brady, thanks so much for coming on today and sharing your information about, you know, your coaching philosophies, the D2 world. I think this is going to be uh, one I suggest a lot of kids listen to if they are balking at all or don't know much about the D2 world because some kids just don't aren't, aren't exposed to it, right? They might not be near a D2 school or at least a good one. Um, and only thing they know about is the local college and or the D1 programs they see in March Madness or on you know ESPN. So I think this is valuable uh resource and i really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing that with us no it's uh it was my pleasure and honor Corey. thanks for taking the time to give me a call and and do this uh you're doing a great job i i uh, look forward to more podcasts and thanks for letting me uh chat about uh, our program and and kind of what we're doing over here a little bit yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, hey, thanks for tuning in today. If you don't want to miss an episode, make sure to subscribe on all the pod, pod class, podcasting platforms, uh, as well as YouTube. It's on both of those. And uh, go to my website, prepathletics.com. Everything you need to know about prep school basketball is on there. So thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Corey.